Hello everybody and welcome to another week of classes. This week we're going to be talking about rhetorical criticism as part of joining a conversation. Because remember, your rhetorical criticism is always trying to say something to an audience and therefore participate in a conversation that's already happening. The conversation you're joining started long before you were ever born, sometimes as early as Aristotle or even further in the past, and it will continue even after you're done writing rhetorical criticism. So we're today going to talk a little bit about what that looks like to actually join a conversation. So today I have assigned you one of the more recent um, articles or forums in a major rhetorical criticism journal. What you're going to see as you read this forum, it'll come from uh, any of the top rhetorical criticism journals, some you may be familiar like um, uh, Rhetoric and Public Address or Quarterly Journal of Speech um, or Text and Performance Quarterly, but this forum is a place where currently very uh, leading scholars and currently publishing academics in rhetorical criticism have got together and said, this is a big issue. And we need to understand and talk about this issue in a way that matters to all practicing rhetorical critics. So we're going to talk a little bit about the one that you're reading for this time um, in class. But specifically, I want you to think about what it means for you as a rhetorical scholar that academic conversations have this as their key question right now. So think a little bit about that and we'll dive into it uh, when we're in class to discuss. Remember to follow all the instructions on what to read that I gave in class and that are listed on your course website. The next thing we're going to do though is talk a little bit about what engaging those sources looks like. It's really easy to read these forums and be like, well, they're talking about three specific texts and none of those are the ones I'm looking at so I don't have to care but you're missing the point. The point is that whatever text you care about, you're still joining a conversation, right? So if we were talking about my, my credibility bookcase behind me or Ferdinand, who has joined me here on the chair again, right? All of that is part of a conversation. Credibility bookcases have some specific cultural meanings during a pandemic. Credibility bookcases have specific cultural meetings with everyone teaching and video chatting so much from their homes. That's a conversation that a critic would need to join. If we consider whether adding a soft and fuzzy cat to a video is actually a valuable part of a text, Ferdinand says he's a valuable part of everything. But if we're considering whether or not that's a valuable part of the conversation that we're having, we need to be able to think about the larger conversation, about cats video bombing their, their humans, about how sad cats are that humans are staying home during a pandemic, or about how we engage with animals in our lives, right? This is very different than ancient Egypt when cats were potentially worshiped or a uh, hundred years ago when cats were really only working farm animals there to catch mice and keep down rodent populations. We have to be able to join that conversation. And so I wanna introduce you a little bit to one way that I think is really valuable to dealing with these kind of resource-based or research-based conversations. So, one way that we will engage with these types of sources, or one way you can think about engaging with this, these, these types of sources, is through the BEAM method. This is a really simple framework to help you think through how you're doing with your sources, whether you're actually doing the right thing to join this conversation, and what sources you're using in what ways, right? So how you're joining the conversation and the ways that you're actually using those sources in your writing. So I'm gonna close this picture so you can see the text on the screen and we'll go ahead and jump into a little bit of the BEAM method of research. This is a great one on which to take notes because I will definitely use it as shorthand when we work on your papers. So if you take a look, we have B, E, A, and M. And those sources 
give us four different categories that we can think of as far as how we use research to join a rhetorical criticism conversation. The first is background sources. And this is content that informs your perspective or thinking. Remember, as a rhetorical critic, you are at the center of your rhetorical criticism. Your perspective is vital. So these might be your personal background. For instance, my personal background in Christian religious faiths, especially far right conservative Christian evangelical faiths or fundamentalism. It might be your background in dance or soccer or in writing or whatever else it might be. This is something that informs your personal background. It might be other classes. Perhaps you've taken a classical um, rhetorical theory with uh, Dr. Downing, or perhaps you've, you've taken persuasion, and those classes inform your thinking. It might be reading that you do in your personal life. Maybe you really love reading novels or self-help books or biographies, or it could be anything else that shapes your perspective as a critic. I'm going to turn this uh, video on just for a moment to say, yes, I do mean Wikipedia and random Google searches. And that's why background sources may or may not be cited in your paper. Sometimes you're going to cite the background sources, but sometimes your perspective is simply shaped because you're talking about a soccer player and you played soccer. That's part of your background, but it's not necessarily something that you cite. Now, it may be something that you need to state as an ethical concern. So for instance, when I wrote about Jerry Falwell's racist rhetoric in his sermons, it was ethically important that I noted that I went to his college and was a critical scholar while I was there. That was a vital ethical consideration for me. But you may or may not cite these sources depending on how important they are to the rest of your paper. The important heuristic is always think about how you're joining the conversation. The next uh, type of sources are E, exhibit or example sources. Uh, and these are the sources that you are actively engaging in your writing. So for rhetorical criticism, these are your texts. The texts that you're going to share um, are your exhibit or, exhibit or example sources. They're also primary sources that might inform your conversation about a particular historic context. So if you're writing about the first women's national soccer team, you probably want to look at maybe New York Times articles or articles from a conservative media outlet or whatever that might be. Um, and those are primary sources that are also exhibit or example sources. So it's any sources on which you are exerting your critical skills. And these you absolutely must cite fully and correctly, including if that means figuring out really complicated citation practices to do it correctly. You absolutely must always cite your exhibit, exhibit and example sources. The third is the type of sources that you're most often familiar with, and these are argument sources. Argument sources are what help you explicitly join a conversation. So if we're talking about your um, rhetorical criticism academic essay, these are the other scholars who you're going to cite. Um, it might also be current events. If we're talking about your popular audience rhetorical criticism, if you were going to write about the amazing coats at the uh, most recent inauguration and how the women wore really cool uh, fashions, you would um, need to join a conversation in order to make your argument. Again, it's really important that you understand what these sources are. Current events, current thinking in the rhetorical criticism discipline, context sources that shape your perspective, whatever these might be though, you must cite them fully and completely. These are the ones that we think about as being in your bibliography and you absolutely must cite them. It is vital that you also understand the breadth of the conversation you're joining. Never simply go and find sources that support your thesis. Good argument sources take in the full breadth of the conversation before settling on your full argument. And then finally, method sources. And I want to draw your attention to this because this is something uh, young rhetorical critics do all the time. The Floss book is not enough. Turning myself on here for just a minute. The false book is not enough. Do not ever submit to me a paper 
where Sonia Foss's textbook is your only source. Don't do it. No, 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 no. Not for capstone, not for rhetorical criticism, not in any other class. Instead, you can cite Foss and the additional scholars that she cites in the incredible helpful bibliography at the end of every chapter. You must understand again the breadth of conversation about your method in order to be a good scholar. So I encourage you to think about the background exhibit argument and method sources you're going to use to join a conversation as a rhetorical critic. So hopefully the BEAM method, along with reading uh, the assigned forum for uh, this week, will give you some sense of where the academic rhetorical criticism conversation is right now. What are the things that practicing rhetorical scholars really care about? And how can you begin to think about joining that conversation? Uh, so be prepared to talk about both of those things. I'm looking forward to discussing some of this higher level rhetorical criticism work with you a little bit in class, and I'll see you all then. Please come prepared to talk about your text, whatever it is you've selected or are in the process of selecting, along with the conversation you'll be joining. Thanks, everybody.